Okay, good morning, everybody. How are we? Happy Saturday. I'm proud of all of you kiddos, young people being here on a Saturday morning. That's because it's pretty exciting to build a boat, and that's what we're going to do. I'd like to welcome you to our boat building school, and this all culminates in the event itself, which is going to be on April 26th at Hurricane Harbor, Six Flags Hurricane Harbor. And so we're excited to have you here in preparation for that. Um, and this, we're excited too, because this is our 25th annual uh, regatta, not boat building school. I don't think we've done boat building school that many times, but it's our 26th or 25th annual uh, boat uh, regatta. And so we're proud to have you here. My name is Jay Ryan. I'll be the pesty voice in the background that you get to hear, and I'm also going to be giving away a lot of stuff. There's a koozie for somebody, and there's a flying pizza for somebody else. Uh, we'll be giving away uh, things, but the reason I'll be giving things away, Tim is going to help me do that, uh, the reason I'm going to be giving away is because you're going to answer questions that I'm going to ask that kind of are things that our presenters have said, okay? And so those questions are uh, very important for you to uh, pay attention to. So who can tell me, don't yell it out, just raise your hand and I'll pick somebody, tell me uh, what date the regatta is. Okay, I'm gonna go over here. Very good, that's for you. All right, so that's how it's gonna work during our breaks in between presentations is we'll do that. Um, so the, uh, the purpose of what, what we're doing here other than teaching you how to build boats is to uh, support the uh, River Legacy Living Science Center. Has anybody been to the Science Center? Do you know where it is? Really neat place with lots of crazy animals in it and crazy people too. And, uh, and, and so it's to support that and the continued preservation and recreational improvements for River Legacy Park, the gem of North Arlington, or the gem of Arlington, but it's up there on, uh, on the river and we're excited to have that. So, uh, when you came in, you should get, should have gotten, uh, or those representing you in the case of this big class over here, you should have gotten the boat building manual, okay? And that has a lot of the advice, the rules, the regulations, the things that, uh, that you need to know to be a good boat builder and uh, to uh, contest on that day on April 26th. Uh, by the way, we're working, uh, starting with sunrise today, we're working on heating the water. Of course, the sun's heating the water, so that's why sunrise was key. Um, the uh, boat building school, you've got the pat packets, the entry forms. At the end, those that want to express your opinion, we have an evaluation form that we'd like you to, uh, to uh, fill out. There's also a registration or an entry form that those that want to participate in the boat build or in the regatta should fill out because that locks your place uh, in, um, uh, in line to participate. We had a fun time last year. We had 204 boats. Whew. And the 204 boats come in different sizes. They come in sizes called guppies. They come in sizes, call, and that has one to two crew members. They have dolphins, that's three to five crew members, and we have whales that are six to 10. And then we also have some mechanical ones that you'll see, and that's what these two guys here are from the mechanical that Gary Daly will describe to you. Uh, so anyway, and those sizes of boats, we ended up being really crowded because we have 204 boats. So we're capping our boats at 200 this year. So it's important, uh, it's just too crowded and we can't, can't get everybody in. So it's important to get in line and get your boats and if, if you're gonna be there, get signed up. And the, the, fees, uh, the fees are lo uh, listed here on the sheet. And uh, there is also an April 1st early, uh, early bird. I don't know, why do they do early birds? I mean, are there, are there late birds? I don't know. Think about that, that might be a, a quiz question coming up. What does a late bird do? Anyway, um, the early bird registration is April 1st. So April 1st is an early bird registration, and I want to say there's, uh, is there a discount for that? $10 cheap, $10 off your entry if you get registered by April 1st. The what? 
Oh, the school rate is the same. It's the, the $50 thing. All right, the other thing that's important time-wise, and there was a sheet out there, if you are a church or a school, not you personally, but if you are here for a church or a school, I have to be so specific. Uh, if you are associated with a church or a school, you can get some free cardboard to build your boats. You get, uh, I think it's five, eight by five sheets of cardboard if you're a church or a school. And, uh, and there are limited times as to where you can pick these up. And this is, if you know the shopping center that's north where the Whole Foods is, this office place, this space that's un, unused at the moment in that shopping center is where we will dispense those pieces of cardboard. So this is the information. There's a sheet out there for where you can get your free cardboard uh, because you are a church or a school. Um, so we've talked about the early bird. We've talked about um, the, uh, the cardboard. And the, uh, there's also the school rate is $50 for all boat categories. So whether you're doing a guppy or a whale, it's, it's the $50 rate. And we uh, are uh, excited to have you join us as a school. So I talked to these folks over here, and apparently they will have four boats, four different boats. So not all of them are going to be in one boat. That'd be kind of challenging. Uh, but uh, if you haven't seen, how many people have been to the regatta before? Okay, some of this group, a number of people, but it's really quite exciting. There's, uh, uh, there are pictures you saw in this presentation, and the boats go from just plain old ordinary boxes that somehow somebody makes them waterproof so they float to, um, uh, to really extravagant uh, pieces of art that, uh, that uh, accommodate up to like uh, 10 or 12 people, I think, is the bigger category, 10 people. So it's pretty exciting to see. And, and, uh, and Mr. Daly and Mr. Sherwood uh, will show you how to build some of those. And so it's going uh, to be pretty instructional coming up. All right, so the other things that are going on, uh, boat members, uh, boat crew members, the number of people are racing in your boat, they get, uh, they get their tickets. But the entry fee includes one ticket per crew member. Uh, you need to buy, the people that come with you need to buy their tickets to get into uh, Hurricane Harbor. Once you're there, once you're in the park, there's a lot of stuff to do. Uh, we also have a challenge that goes on for the second time, second year uh, now, that is the horseshoes and the three-point basketball shoot. So there's a form that talks about that, and there's other competition going on for the horseshoes. And uh, we used to do volleyball and tug-of-war, but this is much better, much less violent. Right? So, um, so we're doing that, and there's the uh, registration form for that. Uh, the other couple of things were uh, brave the waves. So if you've got a boat, and let's say it makes it to the finals, or not, and you are hanging around, and the boat is kind of getting soggy, and you want to have fun, at the end of the day, we will turn on the wave pool, and you can go out into the, into the wave pool in your boat and crash it on purpose, okay? And, and get the nice warm water all over your boat and you and... Ugh. Anyway, uh, and, that's, and, and, and that we charge $20, and that's to raise money, but it's really to, to uh, clean up after everybody. So the, uh, the brave the waves is what we call that. Uh, other things are going on within the park. The tornado is, uh, is going. The tsunami surge and the typhoon twister is open, so you can do that. Now, you might need to buy passes for that. The, uh, the sky coaster, you know that big swing thing? That goes, that's going to be open again this year. And uh, that's $10 per person, two people at a time. And you can go back and forth and, and see the park from a different place. Uh, and so that's going on. And then Hooks Lagoon is open if you, uh, you want to go swimming in those areas. Uh, and we also have a mini boat regatta. And we'll bring the boats down here and show them to you later on the, in the agenda. But uh, the mini boat regatta and the mini boat kits are for sale if you wanted to participate in that. And that's where you take these little mini boats and you basically blow at them and make them go down uh, a channel or a gutter, uh, for lack of a better term to do that. So there are other rules and regulations relative to food, because if you're going to be spending a majority of the day there, you're going to want to have lunch. We sell food. 
uh, and uh, no outside food or drinks uh, is available, but a group like this could order pizzas in advance and we'd have them for you. So that um, the pre-order pizza by school groups is, uh, is good. So the, the, the uh, children's boats or the youth boats uh, are allowed in the park at 8.30. So 8.30 on that day in the morning is when you can start parading in with your boat. The adult boats start at 9.30. And you'll see a guy like this guy in the yellow over here. Tim will probably be standing at the bridge and he'll ask what your boat number is and he'll point to where you ought to go. Okay, and so he'll be my logistician. That's a good big word for you to look up today. Uh, he will uh, be able to tell you, uh, he likes to tell me where to go. We want to thank our sponsors, and you can see some of the signage for that, but Viridian, that's a neat new uh, housing development north of town, north of Arlington. Uh, Westlake Arlington Hardware, Star Telegram, Bates Container, and Randall Mill Pharmacy, and those are our sponsors. All right, and so uh, that's kind of the stuff I needed to cover. What we're going to do now, moving forward, is we're going to talk about um, engineering tips, uh, and uh, then we're actually going to build a mini a, a boat, miniature in size, not a mini boat, but a boat, and uh, and then design ideas. Who will talk about design ideas, and then uh, and then we're not sure. Darla's uh, ill today, so she's not going to be here. We will kind of discuss the mini boat thing, uh, mini boat regatta, uh, and then we'll wrap up. Our first presenter is Gavin McRae. He is a physics teacher, uh, and his wife, Allison, is brand new with our organization. Where'd Allison go? I guess she's out there. Hi, Allison. Allison is brand new with our organization, uh, and she is our volunteer coordinator. So Allison is new, and she brought her husband with, and so uh, uh, Gavin is going to teach us some of the basic principles of what goes on with water and boats and designs and stuff like that. Welcome, Gavin. Thanks, Derek. Okay, um, is that a bit too loud? It's good. It's good? Okay. Uh, so, I'm going to spend just uh, about 15 minutes with you guys just going through a few basic um, physics about boats because I don't want you guys to um, spend a lot of time creating a nice boat and find that when you get, when you get into it at the regatta or, or, if, or before that, and, and when you're testing it and find that it, it, it tips over and it's not stable um, or it completely submerges because it's not big enough and things like that. So um, I'm going to be talking to you about um, a few laws of physics, Newton's first law and the Archimedes principle and, um, and how to make, a, make sure your boat is stable. Okay. Right, so the laser pointed out is pretty good. There's a few pictures from 2012. Uh, this was, I think, one of the winning categories. Uh, don't forget, your boat doesn't have to be just practical. You can, you can, make, you can choose a theme for that as well. So um, this, you'll find a few good themes in this. Um, that, that smaller boat there, that'd be a guppy section, and this boat here I believe would be a dolphin section. That's right, it's a dolphin, yeah. Okay, this guy, I'll give him A plus for effort and getting out there. He just wants to be involved. Anyone can be involved, okay? This, <laughs> this is what happens when all, of the same, all the people are on the same side of the boat, even though it's a nice big boat. Um, that, or the, the people actually are the, are, the, are the biggest significant factor in the weight of the boat because being made of cardboard, the boats themselves aren't really heavy and so the distribution of the people in the boat is a big factor about its stability. I like this theme here, no boys allowed. Um, the, the shape of the, this boat is a very good one. Um, this is a guppy boat. Um, it's got a nice bow or prow on the front there to break the water. Um, it's balanced, it's weighted towards the back, which is good so that it, the front can, can get over the water easily. Um, so that's a very good design, that one. As you can see with this one, uh, probably a bit small, too small for two people. Maybe one person would have been um, applicable. 
Um, in fact, I think right there, in the next few seconds, they're going to be falling over. This is um, the whale section. We've got about eight big guys there. That's a great design with the, the front of that covered there so any water coming up can actually go off. Okay, so let's start about talking some different types of hulls. Now, uh, this, this is a cross section of the hull, so the, the actual boat is travelling either out of the page or into the page, okay? This is a cross section. Um, the, this, the A, B and, and E are pretty good ones. Um, D is the worst hull probably in this, in this lot of six. Um, try not to do that. Um, I'll talk about why in a minute. Um, F is also a possibility as well, but it's more difficult to steer. When it comes to um, the design of your prow or bow at the front, uh, now this is, a, this is a bad one because uh, the, the, the water, it's hard to break the water and it's, it really is pushing water in front of you so it's, it's hard to go fast, okay. This is also a bad one because uh, with this one as you go forwards the nose sinks into the water and so you actually find the boat sinking down into the water which is definitely no good isn't it is it uh, so this is a good one it's okay this is even better so um, look, look at look at one of these last four here okay the water line is that where the water comes up on the side of your boat okay now Newton's first law I want to talk to you about two, two principles to make sure we um, have an understanding and so you team members can understand what you're talking about, okay? Now, Newton's first law says that the, a body is in equilibrium or stationary when all of the forces acting on it balance each other. And that's what we want when, we, when we're all in the boat, okay? So for a boat to stay afloat, the total weight force of the boat and its occupants due to gravity acting on the, the occupants of the boat must be balanced by the upwards uh, buoyant force from the water, okay? When they're balanced, then your boat will, will stay afloat. If the downwards force is greater than the upwards buoyant force coming from the water on the boat, then you'll find the boat will sink, okay? So that's pretty common sense, isn't it? We need those forces to balance. So for example, um, if your boat weighs 30 pounds, okay, this is a cross section as well, the, the boat is going out of the board, okay? And you've got, say, one occupant of 150 pounds. Okay, that means that the total force on the, wa on the water, or, or the total force on, on the boat due to the Earth's gravity is 180 pounds force, okay? Pulling, the Earth's pulling the, the boat and the occupants are down at 180. In order for this boat to stay afloat, we need a buoyant force upwards of 180 pounds force, okay? Now, where does that buoyant force come from? It comes from the fact that the boat's submerged in the water. Okay. And this Archimedes principle, the first guy who discovered, quantified how much force that is. Okay. Uh, Archimedes principle indicates that the upwards buoyant force that is exerted on a body immersed in a fluid, so the upwards force, it, whether the, is partially or fully submerged, is equal to the weight of the fluid that the body displaces. Okay, so what I'm saying there is, because the boat sinks into the water, it displaces water. And the amount of water that it displaces, the weight of that water is the same as the force upwards on the boat. So to show you what I mean there, okay, I've got the same situation, 180 pounds altogether, boat plus occupant, it sinks into the water, and see that that's how much water is displaced by the boat. It actually has to, that, the water displaced there is 180 pounds to balance the boat, okay? If the boat was heavier, if you had more occupants, it would have to sink further down and displace more water 
so that that balances up, okay? And so, as you can see, that, that fits nicely. See how the, uh, that rectangle of water displaced fits nicely about, that's where the water was, okay? It's been displaced. Okay. So, now you guys need to think about how many people you want in your boat and, 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 how, and roughly how heavy your boat is. Now, the main, the main factor is the number of people because your boat might only be 30 pounds here, but you might have, well, your boat could be up to 100 pounds maybe, but you might have, say, you know, five or six people times 150 or 175 pound average mass person, and you're getting up to, you know, about over 1,000 pounds worth of people, and the boat might only be 10% of that. So um, the main factor is the number of people. You need to decide how many people that you want to have in the boat, um, because when you know the weight of the people in the boat, you can then work out how much water has to be displaced. Okay? Now, if, if your boat's a smaller boat, then it has to sink further down to displace the water. And so therefore, the, the water's going to come up the sides higher. Okay? Whereas if you've got a bigger boat, it, it might only have to go down a few inches and it'll displace a fair bit of water. Okay? So there's... There's combinations there. All right, let's let's move on. I, I need to do talk, we need to have some um, a way to talk about what draft means. Okay, so draft, as you can see, is the distance from the bottom of the boat to where the water line is. Okay. Um, so, for this example, we. Yeah, um, you, what, what, you're, what you want is a draft which is not too high from the bottom of the boat, okay? So um, I, I would suggest less than a quarter or even maybe even lower. Um, I, I, I haven't actually built a boat before but, um, and I haven't had a lot of experience, but uh, the next presenter will, will talk to you about more about um, what an ideal draft is. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll move on. Okay, I'm going to do a draft demonstration with one cubic foot. So, here's one cubic foot boat, okay? Um, so, one foot this way, one foot this way, and one foot this way. So, the volume of it, remember volume is, is uh, length times width times height, isn't it? For, for a, a, pr a prism or a cube. Um, so, this is one by one by one, which equals one. So, it's, it's a volume of one cubic foot, okay? There's our boat. Now, because it's so light, um, the draft is negligible. That is, the distance from the bottom of the boat to, the, um, to where the water line is, is almost, you know, not even a quarter of an inch. So, we won't have to worry about that. Let's say it's zero draft. Now, I've got rice for you today because I'd like to, I need a five pound weight, so I've decided to get rice, okay? That's so five pounds. Now, when we put, when we put um, five pounds in, the, the, the weight of the boat and the, and the occupants is going to be about five pounds. Is that fair enough? Okay, that means that in order for this to balance, Newton says we need an upwards force of five pounds from the water to balance it. And that means that Archimedes said that means that five pounds worth of water has to be pushed out of the way. Okay. Does anyone know, before I do that, does anyone know uh, how much water weighs per cubic foot? Does anyone? Yes, yes sir. Excellent. And I'm glad you said 60 rather than the exact value of 62 point something because today I just want to work with 60. All right. Now, um, so, thank you very much. The, the answer is, um, one cubic foot of water is 60 pounds, okay? So another way to say that is if this was filled up with water, it would weigh 60 pounds, okay? But we only want five pounds worth of water to be displaced in order for this to be balanced, okay? So five pounds of water is what fraction of 60 pounds is five pounds of water? One twelfth, right? So we only need to push away about one twelfth of this whole box. Okay, now we know it's 12 inches high along the side. 
So five pounds should go down about one inch of water, in, in, okay? So as you can see, the, dr the draft here is one inch, okay? Um, now the volume, the volume of the water displaced is length by width by height, which is one inch times 12 inches by 12 inches, which is, say, one foot by one foot by a twelfth of a foot, which is about a twelfth of a cubic foot, or five pounds of water has been displaced. That's what uh, Archimedes was right. The amount of water displaced, the weight of that water, is the same as the buoyant force upwards on the boat. Okay. Let's just check if it's if it's if it's linear, or we'll check if it's you know two. 10 pounds, does that make a two inch draft? Balance that. There we go, does that look like about two inch draft? Okay, excellent. And I was wondering whether I should buy, buy three bags or just two bags because it's gonna take a while for us to get through it when we're eating it, but anyway, I bought three bags just to show you. <laughs> so this should be a three inch draft if I balance it. Okay, so there's 15 pounds down and about a three inch draft, which is three twelfths of a cubic foot, which is three twelfths of, of um, 60 pound buoyant force. Okay, so that, that demonstrates about how um, by pushing water away, it actually pushes up on the boat. Now, um, I would like to go through with you a simple calculation about what you, this is the sort type of thing you guys need to do, okay? Uh, what would the draft be for this boat if we want to carry eight people, each with an average mass of 175 pounds, okay? So let's say we've got a, a boat here which is 10 foot long, four foot wide, and two foot high. And obviously with a boat to be all empty in here, hollow. Okay, will, how far will the water come up the side if there's eight people in there? Will it come up halfway up the side? Will it come all the way up, up, up the side? And therefore, you know, will, it, will the water start coming in? We only want it to go probably about a quarter of the way up, okay, or less than that. Okay, to work that out, well, let's say, let's, for the moment, neglect the weight of the boat. How heavy is eight people at a 175 pound average? That's eight times 175. That's about, yes? Pounds, excellent, well done. So he's still in school, so he's really good with his maths at the moment. Okay, so um, 1,400 pounds force down is acting on this boat. So therefore, the amount of water that needs to be displaced by the boat as it sinks into the water is also going to be 1,400 pounds. Now, what, what you could do here is, you, if you look at the, um, the area of the boat here, it's four foot by 10 foot, which is 40 square foot, 40 square feet. And so we know that if it goes down, if it goes down one foot, if the boat goes down into the water one foot, that's displacing 40 square feet times one foot, which is 40 cubic feet. Whoops. I just, um, yeah, okay. Now, 40 cubic feet, how, if, if it goes, so look, we're considering um, this, this boat going down one foot only. If it, if it goes down one foot and displaces 40 cubic feet of water, how, may, how much um, buoyant force upwards would that be? Does anyone know? 40 cubic feet, how much, do, how much does 40 of these weigh in, if it was water? Does anyone know? Times what, 60? 40 times 60? 2,400, excellent. So therefore, if, if, um, if this boat goes down one foot into the water and the water line is at this uh, halfway point here, the upwards buoyant force would be 2,400 pounds, which is more than what we need, because we only need 1,400 pounds, don't we? So this is looking good, okay? Um, for, what, what we do now is we could say, well, 1,400 divided by 2,400 is a bit, a bit more than half. 
So it is going to be about, um, about a quarter of the way, a bit over a quarter of the way. In fact, the answer is um, 6.7 inch draft. In fact, the, the drawing there is pretty to scale. That's where the water will be. So that's good. Okay. Um, I'm happy for you guys to ask me any questions afterwards as well and uh, you know, about how to go about doing that calculation. But the main thing is to remember that uh, we need to displace the same amount of water in weight of, of water as there is occupants in the boat. Okay? I haven't considered the nose of the boat here, so that'll also create some extra benefit for the boat, which we haven't considered. That'll probably balance out the weight of the boat itself. All right, let's move on. This might be a, one that you, that you should do in, maybe at home as a practice. This is a guppy boat. Um, there's, it's one foot high on the sides, it's two foot wide, and then the, there's a, um, a tail and a nose which are on an angle. The volume of this boat, well, the, each of these little cubes here is one cubic foot, the same as one of these here, okay? And so we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten cubic foot. And if you think about this, you, had that been not cut off, you could, there's actually one, two, three, there would have been four there, but since they've been cut off not to, like nice and halved, then there's actually only two there. So we've got ten plus two is uh, twelve, and at the front again, um, had there not been cut off there, would have had six at the front, but it's only three. So 12 plus 3 is 15. There's actually 15 cubic feet, or 15 of these um, for this boat. And the question is, okay, for this guppy boat to carry one person of 150 pounds, what would the draft be? Well, yeah, what we, could think of, we could think, okay, if this, if this boat goes down one foot um, and, and is completely submerged, or about to be completely submerged, then it would be 15 cubic feet in the water. Each cubic foot weighs 60 pound worth of water. So there'd be 15 times 60, which is, which is 900, isn't it? Let's have a look. The weight of 15 cubic feet of water is 900 pounds. So if this boat was fully submerged, it would actually uh, displace 900 pounds worth of water. Um, that's the maximum this boat could ever possibly carry, but you wouldn't want that, would you? Because you, as soon as you tip sideways slightly, a bit of water comes in, and then that'd be even extra weight, and then you'd be in a big problem, wouldn't you? So we don't want 900 pounds. We don't want 900 pounds, but um, we only, actually, the person only weighs 150. So 150 out of 900 is one sixth. So the, the, the actual draft is only going to be one sixth of the full height of this boat, which is good. So. Um, And therefore, it'd be a two-inch draft for that example there, okay? And that's, that one's in your book. All right, let's... Now, I've just sh shown you here um, some um, blueprints of uh, a smaller boat. That's one example where it's one and a half foot wide. And um, there's, some, there's some tips on that. And th these are in your notes as well, okay? Here's a dolphin one, which is two and a half foot wide. And but each of these boats have more than one wall. On the, especially on the sides, like you can see here, that's the wall on the way up, and then that's the wall on the way back, so it's double walled. Okay, this, this one here, remember guys, uh, this is not the entire blueprint, because this is a whale boat, so a lot bigger, so I've only shown you um, one side of it, okay? Um, this one's two and a half foot wide, is it? Or, no, four foot wide, okay, because it's wider. The more people, obviously, the bigger the boat's going to have to be. Now, I want to um, talk to you about stability because um, there's some questions that you might make. You could decide to have a boat which is a square shape that you can jump in or you might want to have a boat which is like maybe two foot across and four foot long, which is a rectangle. Or you might want to have a boat which is eight, eight foot long and only one foot across. Okay, so there's different ways you can, you can um, shape the hull uh, and still have the same draft. Okay, but which one's more stable? We need to find a balance between stability as well as um, efficiency. Okay, so 
I'm going to talk to you, I'm going to show you, um, here's an example where um, we've got a 30 pound boat again, 150 pound person, so it's, it's 180 pound force on total acting on the boat and the person due to gravity and the draft is, uh, is four inches say. So let's say it sinks in the water four inches and it's two foot wide here, down here. And you should be able to find out that with that draft and that weight, actually the boat length is four and a half foot. Okay. The displaced water has to be 180 pounds because it's got to balance the weight. Okay. Now let's consider the situation when and this will happen. Everyone's this is going to happen in the regatta when you get in and the boat rocks a bit, or maybe you're already in there and someone's you've, you've knocked into someone, or maybe a wave's come along. At some stage, this boat is going to be on a slight angle. Okay, what's going to happen? Here's a 10 degree angle. Now this is what happens for a boat which is two foot wide. The weight. The weight force is still acting through the centre and that doesn't change. But look what happens with the displaced water. It, because it's on an angle like that, the, the displaced water tends to be more on to the, over to the right and the buoyant force upwards due to that displaced water acts in the centre of that displaced water, which is called the centre of buoyancy, which is there. Okay. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? They're no, they're no longer collinear. Well, in this case, it's a good thing because those two forces, even though they balance, which is good, the boat won't sink, they actually um, create a counterclockwise, what we call a torque or a moment. Okay? So the boat has rotated clockwise, but the two forces together make an anti-clockwise or a counterclockwise moment, which is a correcting moment. So it actually goes back to normal, okay, which is good. Do people understand that? So a square shaped hull like this boat here is a good thing and the fact that the, um, there's a corner here which displaces water here um, is actually a good thing because it actually puts the boat back upright so, so that you'll find that if you want to just do a basic square shaped boat that's going to that's work, okay. Um, the distance between these two lines of action of the forces is called the perpendicular moment arm and uh, the length of that is an indication of how, how stable it is. So the, 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 long, the further away these two forces are, the, the more stable it is. So this is a quite a stable situation. Now, I'm going to show you a situation where we've got the same draft and it's only one foot across, but because it's the same weight, this must be a longer boat. Okay, this is a, a nine-foot length boat, um, but it's so it's so it's um, it's a narrower boat, but it's longer. So it's the same um, area of base. That that's that's why we get the same draft because it's the same weight. Okay. In this situation, um, same weight. Um, the displaced water here looks like it's smaller, but because it's longer, it's actually the same amount of displaced water. Same buoyant force upwards. Now, we're going to tilt at 10 degrees again, the same as before. But look at this situation here with the, um, with the displaced water. It's slightly different. Okay, see the shape of this here? It's like a trapezoid, isn't it? Let's go back to the other one and have a quick look at the other one. That's more like a triangle, isn't it? Um, yeah, that's more like a triangle there. Whereas this one is more like a trapezoid. Now what happens when the boat's narrower, um, the centre of buoyancy tends to be closer to the centre. In fact, here I've, I've pretty much shown it on the centre because some of this bottom has actually moved to the left slightly and also um, because it's not a triangle, it's a, it's a trapezoid, uh, this doesn't move as far across. Okay, um, And the, the horizontal moment arm is a lot smaller. In fact, sometimes there's situations where the boat's so narrow or the whole shape is, is not, not, a, not a square 
Um, I spoke with Jay earlier. He had an example where we had a hull which was not, not that square shape, but from your point of view, it was like a, maybe a V shape. And when it moved, it didn't displace water in an, in an ideal way. And you can get situations where the, um, these two arrows are actually creating a, creating a moment which is clockwise, which makes the situation worse. So as soon as you rotate clockwise slightly, you, you then go further clockwise. And, and, and that's why boats, as soon as you get in them, you'll fall over. Okay, so the main thing is that I want you guys to take away from me today is that um, that that draft there of four inches, yeah, that, and I'll, I'll go back to the um, the more ideal case, say this one here. Okay, this draft here of four inches has a big effect on um, stability as well as this width across here. And I would suggest that for a two foot width, don't go higher than a four, width, four inch draft, okay? So that's um, a ratio of one to six. Um, if, you, if for some reason your draft is more than six inches, you need to have a wider boat, okay? Otherwise you'll tip over, all right? Um, in, this, in this worst case example here, here we have a four inch draft with only a one foot width, that's a one to three ratio. That is, that's a third of this length here. That's that's the unstable situation, okay. So, uh, but I'd, uh, then you might be thinking, what about just going four four foot wide? Make sure it's not going to tip over. The problem with that is that um, unless you're carrying a lot of people, that might be unnecessary because you've got to. You've, the wider it is, the harder it is to get through the the water as well. So there's got to be that balance, okay. Uh, I think and I'll, I've got one more photo. I think, uh, yeah. which um, just thought I'd throw that in there. <laughs> okay, thanks very much for your time, guys. If you uh, missed any of what he said, you can. I forgot to mention earlier that there is a video that will be available that you can uh, you can either see it on YouTube. You can see prior years and this one's. Uh, give us a week and we'll have it up on YouTube and you can get that link through our website. And uh, there's also a, um, a DVD of it that you can borrow from uh, River Legacy. So if you wanted to take this to a classroom and show it to a class or just take it home and look at it, you're welcome to do it that way. So you can, uh, if you missed any of the accents, and I wish I could do a British accent, I just can't. But if you missed any of the accent issues, uh, you could do that. You ready, sir? Ready as I'll ever be. Gary Daly with Randall Mill Pharmacy, one of our sponsors. Thanks, Jay. Can everybody hear me okay? All right. Wow. Who said engineering wasn't exciting? <laughs> nice work, Gavin. That was, a, that was a dynamic presentation and gave you really all a good overview of what principles need to go into the design of your boat to calculate the draft of your boat how big, how small, how wide, how long. Okay, so we've gone through that. We've got some plans that we can work off of. We've got an idea how we need to build these boats. Um, but before we do that, we've got to gather certain supplies. And I'm briefly going to go over a list of some supplies that you'll need uh, to build your boat. First thing we're going to need to build a cardboard boat is cardboard. Our friends at Westlake uh, Arlington Hardware usually have it available sheets of cardboard in single ply thickness, double ply thickness, two different uh, thicknesses, and they vary in size from year to year, just depend on what's available from the cardboard manufacturers, but they're usually either four feet by eight feet or five feet by eight feet, something like that. And uh, that really is the easiest way to get the cardboard to build your boat, because you've got nice, big, flat, clean sheets without staple holes and creases and dents and holes and stuff. But you don't have to use those sheets. You can get an old refrigerator box or moving boxes and you can, you can assemble a boat out of any size or shape or style of cardboard and, and it, sometimes it's a little more difficult, a little more time if you don't have the nice big clean flat sheets, but um, it, it can be done anyway. 
Other things that, we need, that you'll need to build your boat, you can see a variety of things up here. Glue, gotta have some glue to glue the cardboard together. We usually just use a, a, a wood glue like you see up here, one of these yellow wood glues, but you can use good old white Elmer's glue. That works equally as well, really. Um, gonna need some glue. Gonna need some tape. There's a variety of tapes that you can use, and we'll, we'll get into some examples of how to use these tapes here in a little bit. Um, the, uh, there are some tapes that you can use and some that you can't. The rules say you have to use a paper tape. Well, this is good old wet it and stick it packing tape. This is what we like to use that we recommend that. You can use masking tape. Masking tape is a paper tape, so that's, a, uh, that's an approved product. But you cannot use, this is a plastic tape here. You probably can't see it from there, but this is a plastic tape. That's not an approved product. Duct tape is not an approved product has to be a paper-based tape. Some of the seams and edges on your boat, it's okay to use caulk. There's a couple of kind of caulks you can use. We usually like to recommend, uh, I like this one right here. It's relatively inexpensive. It's made by DAP. It's called Alex Plus. It's a uh, combination of latex and silicone. It's fairly inexpensive. It dries pretty fast and it's paintable. You can paint over this. Some people will use a silicone caulk, which is okay too. It maybe seals a little bit better. It's maybe a little bit more flexible and, and less likely to crack and pull apart, but it's quite a bit more expensive. It smells terrible, um, and it takes quite a bit longer to dry, usually 24 hours at least to dry. So we usually, we usually like to use, excuse me, use this uh, Alex latex silicone combo. All right, so you've, if you can go with me here, you've got your boat built, you've taped the seams, you've caulked the seams, now you're ready to waterproof it. What we like to recommend for waterproofing it is a polyurethane. They make two kinds of polyurethane. There's an oil base, which is what this is, I believe, an oil-based polyurethane, and they also make a water-based polyurethane. What's the difference, you say? Well, oil base, Polyurethane is a little less expensive than the water base. It's a little harder to, the oil base is a little harder for cleanup, takes longer to dry, but actually waterproofs a little bit better than the water-based polyurethane. So to the contrary, the water-based polyurethane is more expensive, easier to clean up, faster drying, but doesn't waterproof quite as well. We, I recommend this. Uh, it, we use that on our boats and uh, have had real good luck with it. Then once you've, that's a clear material, so once you've waterproofed your boat with that, you'll uh, probably want to paint your boat. You wouldn't have to because if you put three or four coats of that polyurethane on there, your cardboard's waterproof. Most people want to put a design or color on their boat. Same thing here. Uh, same rules apply with uh, the paints. You can use a latex paint or a water-based paint. Less expensive, easy to clean up, dries pretty fast, but doesn't waterproof quite as well. Or you can use an oil-based paint. A little more expensive, a little harder to clean up, takes a little longer to dry, but waterproofs better. And that, in a nutshell, is uh, the materials that you'll need uh, to complete your boat. And you'll also need a few basic tools, and we'll talk about those. Um, you're going to need a ruler or a yardstick or a straight edge like this, and we'll show you how to use that here in a little bit. You're going to need a tape measure, obviously, to do some measuring. A good old number two pencil. You guys know what number two pencils are? Or do, is everything computer now? I don't know. All right, so we'll use number two pencils. Um, here's a funny little tool. These, are, uh, these were originally designed as a coping saw. These had a little saw blade in them. We took the saw blade out and just put a piece of wire on there. But we're going to use the handle of this to crease the cardboard, to make ridges or to make creases in the cardboard so we can make a nice neat fold and we'll show you in a minute how to do that also. And if you don't have one of these there's lots of things that you can do 
use to do uh, creases with. Here's a little crescent wrench. Anything with a rounded edge on it, we can, you can use that as a creasing device, and, and we'll get into that here in a little bit, how to do that. We're gonna have to cut the cardboard. You can just use a good old-fashioned utility knife, okay, with a razor blade in it uh, to, cut your, to cut your cardboard. And that's a brief overview of the materials, and we're gonna have to kinda go through pretty fast here in a little bit to get through all of this, so um, if I skip over something or miss something, uh, we'll have some questions at the end, and, and Bob and I'll be glad to stay after as long as we need to to answer any questions that anybody's got. So, but if you can hold your questions till we're done, that'll be great. Um, so now you've got, if you can envision, you've, got, you've gathered up your materials, you've studied your uh, engineering, your design, you know how big you want to make your boat. What I recommend you do, first thing you do is, like those plans you see up there, maybe just do a rough drawing of how you're going to lay your boat out on a piece of paper. This is just kind of a rough sketch. I don't know if you, I think you all can see that from here. All right, and, and look at that and see if you think you like what it looks like. And then do a more detailed drawing like this. All right, and we're going to show you here on this piece of cardboard how we did that. You can do a more detailed drawing on that. And I like to do it on just a good old manila file folder, just like this. Okay, and what we did here was we drew our boat out on this manila file folder and we folded it all up and we made a little scale model boat. I can't stress enough how important it is to do that because you'll save a lot of time. If you make a mistake on your drawing here and it doesn't fold up and look the way you want it to or the, it doesn't come together the way you think it should, you haven't wasted a lot of time, effort, or expense on materials. Whereas if you do, if you just say, heck with it, I'm not going to draw a plan, I'm just going to get a big piece of cardboard and I'm going to start folding, cutting, creasing, and gluing. If you haven't done it before, I just about guarantee you when you start folding it and putting it together, it's not going to come together the way you think it is. So this is really important, a real time saver to draw it out on a manila folder and make a little model. Be glad to let anybody look at those they want to uh, after we're done here. So I've done that. I've laid it out on my manila folder. Now I'm about ready to uh, start putting the boat together here. Now, we're gonna go through this kind of fast and because and, uh, we don't have a lot of time, but we're, our goal today here is to build a small boat. It won't be big enough for a person to go in, but show you each step and each component that goes into building a boat. All right, now if you remember, we had this nice little drawing here. All right, we've transferred that onto a bigger piece of cardboard. Okay, those, those look very similar. We did this, we made our model, now we're ready to make a full-size boat. Now, for the purposes of our exercise today here, this isn't really a full-size boat, but it's, it's gonna be a, a, a real cardboard boat that uh, you can see. Now, on some of the plans up there, your pieces of cardboard that you're gonna get are not gonna be big enough, which you'll see here in a little bit. When we fold this up, this is gonna look like a boat for two cats or a dog or something. It's not gonna be big enough to put people in, but it'll give you an idea how the boat goes together. The way you get a piece of cardboard big enough to fashion into a boat that you can put one, two, or 10 people in is we simply splice sheets of cardboard together. Okay, you look at the back side of this, I think you can see from there that we took four pieces. Can everybody see that okay? We took four pieces of cardboard. Now granted, this is on a smaller scale, but if you can envision this being four feet and this being eight feet, scaled down obviously, but if you can envision that, what we've done is we've created one big piece of cardboard that's um, eight feet across and 16 feet long. Now that's probably pretty close to, uh, you would need one almost that size to fashion a uh, guppy or maybe even a small dolphin boat. Now the, the way we do that is we have these four sheets of cardboard and then we just overlay some strips, some smaller strips of cardboard 
across those seams and glue those and we just put a little weight on it to hold it in place. Can everybody see that okay? So if you can envision this being a 16 foot long piece of cardboard that we spliced a whole bunch of, or four pieces together to make that, this would end up being about a 15 or 16 foot long boat. Now we're going to take this guy and fashion him into a boat here and we're going to show you some of the the principles and the uh, techniques that we use to, to do that. As you're looking at this you can see we've got some solid lines and dashed lines. Most of the lines are dashed. You can see a few solid lines down there at Bob's end of the uh, the sheet of cardboard and but a lot of dashed lines. Well the dashed lines are where we're going to make a fold or a crease. And we're going to fold this up in uh, hopefully in about 20 or 30 minutes here. This is going to look a little bit like a boat and, and uh, so without further ado we're going to get started on this and grab some of our tools here. We've got a couple of our creasing tools here and the way we do a crease, some of this we've pre-creased a little bit so we don't, you don't have to watch us make a hundred creases, but what we do is we'll just take a, a straight edge, a metal ruler works best but just a good old wooden yardstick works fine too and we're going to use that rounded end of that and we're just going to go back and forth along our dashed line with this creasing tool several times. If you push real hard all at once, um, I'll just do it out here to show you and maybe you can hear it or see it. If I do it real hard all at once, I don't know if you can hear that or not, but I kind of ripped my cardboard. Okay, that's not terrible, but it's best if you don't do that. So that's why when we're creasing, we like to just kind of continuously just apply gentle pressure and go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth until we compress the flutes on the cardboard. You guys didn't know this was a band lesson, did you? We're talking about flutes now. What the heck's a flute? Well, if you look at the edge of a piece of cardboard, see the little waffle in there? There's little waffle edges in there. Those are what we call flutes. Well, when we use our creasing tool, what we're doing is crushing, gently crushing those flutes. And then what that does is creates a nice straight line that allows us to make a nice straight, uh, nice straight crease on our uh, cardboard. So some of this we've already, we've already uh, done our creasing and what we're gonna do is just kind of fold this up. We'll show you how we do that. You can see how, see we, we pre, we crease that and when we fold that over and we're going we're gonna to bend it past and get that, get a nice good crease on there, okay, I'll turn it around here and let you see. You can see what a, a nice straight line that made all along there, okay. If you don't crease it and you try to fold it, you, you'll get a, a big old wavy line like that. So you got to crease it gently back and forth several times. And uh, yeah, several times, and then that gets you a nice straight crease. We've got a few cuts to do down here, and we're going to do that real quick. And Bob's going to uh, fold some of those creases up back here. And I think Sue Wilhide, who will come up later and talk, I think uh, Sue, do you still do all the cutting on your boats or? Yeah, a lot of the, the school groups, uh, the teachers, these, these knives are really sharp and they can be a little bit dangerous. So I think some of the school groups, uh, the teachers will do all of the, all of the cutting because they, they can be really sharp. And, uh, but turn, turn the students loose on the, on the creasing and gluing. The gluing is the part they like best, right, Sue? <laughs> Oops, sorry. So we're going to get these cuts done here real quick.
I guess we do have a couple there, don't we, Robert? We're gonna just we're gonna go around this thing and, and get all these creases done real quick. Slide it down there. We've got one more crust here we need to do. these creases folded up here and then we're going to start shaping this thing into a boat here in just a minute and what you'll see as we get further along is this right here all right see how nice that when we we lift that up we we've, we've gone over that before we got here today several times several times with our creasing tool to make a, a good dent in our flutes. There we go, like that. Yeah. One more here. All right, now what you're gonna see as we move along with this, this, uh, did we get these? All right, got a couple more here, sorry. One more here. What you're going to see as we go along with this, this is just right now, I mean, this is just a big old floppy piece of cardboard. It flips and flops and doesn't have much stability to it. But as we get each step as we go on this, as we get a little further along, it's going to pick up more strength and stability. And there's a couple of tricks to that as we go. Refer glue on Let's use this one too. All right. All right. Now, another little trick of the trade we do is uh, when we get ready to apply the glue on here, we use little, little, just little scraps of cardboard we've got laying around as a trowel or just a, a spreading device to spread our glue. And uh, so you keep, you know, don't throw all your scraps away because they come in handy as you're going as you're going along. Do we want to do the bow first? Huh? The floorboard? Okay. Now, we've got, uh, this is going to be the side of our boat, and as you can see, we'll turn it around here. When we get that together there, it's going to be hollow down that side. Okay, so that's kind of a, it's a double walled side. And that's going to give it a lot of strength from front to back. What you see a lot on uh, race day is a lot of these boats, when they get out there in the water, if they don't have, they'll have a single ply side all the way along, and these boats will just kink in the middle. They'll break right in half, right in the middle. Person in the front, first person in the back, and these boats will go like that. Yeah, you're going to give us a mark there. Yeah. We're just making a, uh, a little line down the center here. And what that's for, that gives us a point. So we get this tab, this tab here, get it to the center of the boat. And we're gonna, we're gonna glue that in here in just a second. But back to what we were talking about with the, the sides on these, we always like to, just about always we'll build our boats with a side like this that's hollow. And uh, if, you, if you're building a bigger boat and a longer boat, we still do a hollow side, but sometimes we'll put a little reinforcement, another layer of cardboard inside of here to give the boat some longitudinal or lengthwise strength because these boats want to kink in the middle. That's kind of the, kind of the nature of them. So now here again, we like, we like to use this yellow glue 
It's just a wood glue, and there's, there's a little trick to putting this glue on. And when I say trick, what I mean is you can get too much or not enough. And really what you want to do is spread out just a fairly thin layer. If you get too much glue on there, it takes a long time to dry and, and get sticky and set up. And if you don't get enough glue on there, it doesn't stick at all. But I think you'll see here in a minute as we, we put this together. Let's go ahead and do the other side too. Well, we're going to pull both of these tabs on this side in here. And stick it to the floor here. And we'll hold this up in a second and let you see about how much glue is the right amount of glue. And that looks, that looks pretty good right there. Maybe a little, little thick right in there. Okay, I don't know if y'all can see, see that glue okay there, but that's about how much glue you want on there. Well, how does, how does this glue work? Well, maybe we need to get the physics teacher back up here, but I'll, do, I'll take my best shot at it. Glue has water or moisture in it, all right? And this cardboard absorbs that moisture, and once the, the moisture is out of the glue, then it becomes sticky and tacky and will hold together. And so if you get too much glue on there, the water can't absorb or or wick out all of that water or moisture that's in the glue. It, it just takes, I mean, it will eventually, but it takes a long time. All right, so we're gonna pull these sides together here. And let me grab that clamp. We're gonna put just a little clamp, couple of little clamps on here to hold this in position. All right, now here's, you're going to see right now one of the specialty tricks of the trade. And uh, this is a specialty clamp. It's called a bucket of paint. And we'll do this, we do this a lot. We've got those tabs that you saw inside of here that had glue on the back side of it. And we need just a little weight of some sort just to kind of hold that down and hold that in position while that glue is drying. And it's, it's amazing how fast that dries if you get the right amount of glue on there. You get too much, I, don't, I know I already said this, but you get too much on there and it takes a long time to dry. You might have to leave this on here an hour or two hours. But if you get just the right amount, we can clamp it up like we did here. And um, we'll be able to take these clamps off and these weights out of here in maybe, oh, three or four or five minutes. And Bob's... I'm just going to throw a couple of tools that we're going to use later on here just as a little extra weight to kind of hold things together. Now what we're going to try to do is, uh, this is the front or the prowl of our boat, and we're going we're to kind of try to get that shaped up here a little bit and show you how that's going to go together. We're going we're gonna to put this together, and you're not going to be able to see very well what we're doing right here. But when we put the back together, it's just a duplication of what we're doing on the front here. And uh, by then, I think our glue on the floor will be dry enough. We'll be able to kind of tip it up and let, let you see a little bit better. So we're going we're gonna to glue these tabs up here. Now, what we've got, what we've got inside of here is... We got two tabs of cardboard, and we're folding them inside like this, and we're putting our glue right on these surfaces in here. And we're gonna, we've got some little clamps we're gonna put inside here, and we'll tip this up in a minute to where you can see it better. Yeah, it's good enough. I'm just gonna put three or four of these clamps on there. Hang on a second. Okay. 
And we're going to go ahead and do this on the, uh, we're going to slide this down and do the other side of the back here. Do the same thing down here. I don't think we can get them all, get in all the clamps in there. So let's do this. We're going to do the same thing right here. While we're letting our floor dry, I want to get that floor dried a little bit before we take our weights off of there so we can tip it up and kind of show you what's going on inside of here. All right, here again, we're going to put three or four little clamps in there. All right. I think we can pull these out here, I think. All right. We think our floor is set up long enough here that we can pull these uh, fancy weights out of here. Now we can kind of kind of tip tip this up now and show you what we did inside of here a little bit better. Okay, you can see. Let's hold it up, Bob. You can see that we're, how we've got those clamps inside there, and if we turn it over, you'll be able. To, oops. Turn it over, you can see how this this seam came together here, and we'll talk more about how we deal with that in a little bit. All right, so now if Bob, Bob grabs the other end of that boat and holds it up, you can see it's, it's kind of starting to get rigid and it's getting a little strength to it, but it's still, still kind of sloppy and a little floppy. As we go each step, this boat gets stronger and stronger. All right, we think, we feel like uh, this has been clamped long enough that it's gonna hold together, so we're gonna pull that out of there. I mean, literally that's, that's how fast that glue dries and sets up and holds the cardboard together if you get the right amount on there. And uh, when we glue a couple other things here in a minute, we'll show you again one more time what, what looks like about the right amount of glue. I'll tell you what, Bob is fabulous at spreading glue. I can't tell you how good he is at that. I'm just a good assistant. You got it? You like it? We need to pull this yeah, yeah, we will. We'll just tape that. All right. I think we're good on the back here, too. We're going to do the same thing back here. You know what, before we do that though, now I'm going to do something that I don't want you guys to do when you're building your boat, but I'm going to do it just so you can see. We've got a crease right here for this to fold in, but I'm going to fold it back. We don't, you don't want to do that. You don't want to fold it the wrong direction, but I want you to see this in here. We've left a couple of little tabs in here, all right, that we'll use in a little bit because we're going to put in what's called a bulkhead. A bulkhead is just a fancy nautical term for a wall, for a wall. And so we're going to put a little wall in there and that's going to add to the strength of this boat like we talked about a little while ago. All right, so we're going to swing this around and, and glue that part together here. And put some clamps on here. I know some of this seems repetitive and we're doing some of these things over and over, but we wanted you to see kind of how a boat goes together from start to finish and, and what it might look like when you're done. Good. It's always nice to keep a, uh, a, a little towel around, a damp towel, and wipe, wipe your glue up. A lot of times you'll get uh, some excess glue on some part of your boat where you may not want it. And I always recommend just as quick as you can, if you spill some extra glue, just take a damp towel or a sponge that's not too wet. You don't want to get the cardboard soaking wet, but you can get it a little moist and wipe off that excess glue. And what that does for you is when you uh, get ready to paint or 
put your finish on your boat, then it has a nice smooth finish and it doesn't, doesn't have uh, bumps and bumps and drips and the like. Oh, yep. All right, we're going to, here again, that, I mean, that's all it takes. This, this front, uh, this front's coming together. Now here again on the front, we've got these two little tabs and what Bob's doing is he's folding them inside and we're going to put a little layer of glue on those. When we laid this out this morning, we, we really, these tabs are not long enough. I'll show you on the other end. This was a little mistake we made. You can see these little tabs that were folding inside there. They're maybe a half or three-eighths of an inch. Those really should be about an inch long, but our cardboard was a little shorter than we wanted it to be. But since we're not putting this in the water, it should be okay. But what we're going to show you here when we do this is another method by which we clamp stuff. And sometimes there's not a place where you can put a clamp on it or um, put a weight on it. And what we do sometimes is we'll just use masking tape. And this blue tape is not as sticky as the old white masking tape that you might be used to. But it, uh, when you peel it off, it doesn't peel this. When you go to take it off, it doesn't take the skin of the cardboard off with it. So we're going to use this blue tape as a clamp. You can see we're just holding it together with that. And we'll just leave that on there for a little while and uh, let that glue set up and then we'll, we'll pull it off. Now on this other end, we had enough cardboard down here. I don't know if you can see in there, but these, these tabs here, these are more the length of tab that you want that's, that's big enough to have a, a more significant surface to glue to each other. Bob's going to hit that with glue here. All right, now those tabs inside there, they're big enough that I can get my clamp on that. So I'm going to do it a little different on this end. I'm going to stick my clamp in there. And we'll hold it together with, hold it together with those clamps. While that's, while that's going on, I'll show you another little trick that we do from time to time as a clamping technique. And you don't have to have a, a power drill like this. You can use just a regular screwdriver. But we'll just use some little, little wood screws to hold things together sometimes. And you're going, oh, hey, hold it, mate. Wait a minute. You're punching a hole in your boat. Well, yeah, we are. We we'll just use that to pull that together, all right? Now, keep in mind, you can use screws to, to clamp or hold it in place, but once your glue is dry, the rules say the boat can't have any screws in it, so you have to be sure and take that out once your glue is dry. You all look along there. Can you all see how that's bowing out there a little bit and not pulled quite completely together, if you can see that or not? Hold the back of that boat up for me, Bob. Hold the back up so it doesn't fall. I'm going to put another screw in here. I'm not sure you can see from there, but we're going to put that in there. Could you see how that pulled that together a little bit better? Pulled that up close? Now, we'll show you how to deal with those holes in a little bit also. All right, starting to look like a boat. Are we getting there? I think we're getting there. Okay, this guy here, this little clamp, we're going to take that off, and I'm going to have Bob hold the other end of the boat here again. All right, we've got, we've got it shaped up, and I'm trying to twist it now, and I can still turn it and twist it a little bit, but it's getting, it's getting more and more stable all the time. The thing that really state starts to really, see how, the, see how that's kind of flexy and bounces around, and it doesn't have a great deal of strength, but it's got more than it had a little while ago. The trick to really giving these boats the strength they need, let's do the other ones first, I think is putting in these bulkheads. All right, we've made two little bulkheads, and there again, that's just a fancy, fancy word for a wall. All right, now, I don't know if y'all remember these little tabs. 
we had on the end of these walls here earlier. Okay, we left, there, we left those there on purpose because we wanted something to glue this bulkhead to that we're getting ready to put in there. So what we're going to do is we're going to put some glue on those tabs. No. Bob will work on that end and I'll work on this end. We've got some tabs on here also. There's a tab here and a tab here. These are each going to stick to the outside wall of the boat. This is going to stick to the bottom of the boat. And then this one is going to be left on the top up here. And that's going to give us something to glue what we call our bow cap. Or we're going to cover this area here. That's going to give us a tab to glue that to. So we're going to stick these guys in there real quick. I'm going to spread this glue out a little bit. I put some on top. I didn't want to do that yet, so I'm just going to kind of squeegee that off of there. And with a little bit of luck, it'll fit. Did yours fit, Bob? He said, of course. Yeah. Oops. Rather than put the glue on these tabs on the end of the wall, I'm just going to put a little glue on my bulkhead here that's going to be out on that edge. It's going to catch those, those tabs that are on the end of the wall there. All right, we're going to stick this little guy in there. Okay, and here again, we're going to use uh, one of these bar clamps. You can see Bob's put a bar clamp on that end. And right, he's going to do the screw trick again here too and sh shoot a screw into those tabs on the end just to kind of pull that Pull that bulkhead up tight to those tabs. Couldn't find my other clamp. Here it is. You like it? He likes it. All right, that's that's good. Let's tip it up. All right, now you can see these these tabs we've got left over here, this is, we're going to put a cover on this to cover up this area of the boat. You can see they're overlapping here a little bit. We did that on purpose because we didn't calculate the angle ahead of time. But what we're going to do is we're going to just take and do a little cut there, cut some of that excess material off so that when we do this, so that when we fold these tabs in, you can see they just come to a nice straight line there. Okay, and that's going to give us a good surface to attach that bow cap to. We're going to do that on uh, all three parts of this triangle. Got her? All right, now you can see what what we did there is we just did some little relief cuts or just cut away that excess material and when we pull, pull this down and together now all of these come together nice and nice and straight and what we're going to do is we're going to just lay a piece of uh, cardboard across our bow and across our stern to seal that up. Let's check the strength of this thing now. We're going to leave our clamps on there for a minute. I can feel it. I, I know you really can't see it, but it's really getting sturdy. It's really getting sturdy and getting rigid now. All right. But a boat, these boats also, to add strength so they don't kink in the middle, we're going to add a bulkhead here in the middle also. All right. This guy right here, that's our middle bulkhead. All right. So we've done a number of folds and creases on this, and we're going to fold that together and put it to. Uh, Put it in the middle of that. I crease those on the wrong side. Okay, I'm just gonna go in. okay. those are already pre-creased. I'm going to fold that in like that. Fold all of these tabs in. All right, can you see that coming into shape there a little bit? All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to take that guy, fold him like that, fold all of these tabs in, and we're going to set push this down in there and glue it in position and that's going to give us a bulkhead or a wall in the center of the boat. 
and I can't stress how important that part of putting a boat together is. I always recommend that when you're building a boat to have a bulkhead between the compartments for each crew member, okay? Uh, if you've got two crew members, let's just pretend this is a little bit bigger boat. We're going to have a crew member in the back and a crew member in the front. We want one of these in here. If we're going to have, uh, if this is a three-person boat, if we're going to have one, two, three, we want two of these bulkheads in here, make it creating a compartment for each crew member. All right, I'm going to just, and this is another thing that we always like to do. We haven't done it yet, but when we make a part or a piece for a boat, we like to dry fit it just to put it in position and make sure it fits right before we glue it all up and make sure it fits in there the way we think it's going to. Okay, well, I lucked out. That one fits pretty good. So since we've done that, we're going to we'll glue all of these tabs up. And we're going to stick him in there in a second. And to save a little time, we're not going to spread the glue out on this. Because we're not really going to get in this boat. You can. You want to get in the boat? <laughs> you know what? I've, been, I've rethought that. And you know, I really think that I'd prefer to spread the glue out now. Holy, holy moly. All right, so we got, we got our glue on there. And this is, when you put one of these bulkheads in there, it's kind of a four-hand project almost. But I'll go ahead and do it all by myself, I guess. That's fine. Just go right in. <laughs> all right, so we got it down in there. And you can see, now you can see we got some extra glue slopped on there. But uh, here's what I was talking about earlier. You can just take, take a damp towel and wipe that excess glue off of there and it cleans up pretty good. All right, now to, to hold that in place, all of those tabs are to the inside. So we're gonna, we're gonna move these clamps back and pull that together and snug that up. All right, so, so we, got that, we got that in there good and snug. All right, so now that we got that in place, we're gonna, we're gonna fashion a couple of uh, a, a bow cap and a uh, stern cap here right quick. There are several ways you can do this. We're, this is just kind of a quick way. We're going to just hold this on there and we're going to just go underneath and trace the outline of the boat. You got it? We're going to just trace the outline of the boat underneath. Do that in there. All right, that's pretty simple. We just we just drew a little triangle on there, so now we're just going to cut that out. That's old guys. Sorry. Yeah. All right, we're just going to cut this out here real quick. And we're doing this because I want to show you, we're going to get to taping and caulking here in just a minute. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that, but when we get to the taping and caulking, there's a couple little tricks that are beneficial for you. Cut him out. All right, we're going to stick him on here in just a minute. All right, I'm, I'm doing a dry fit again here, and he fits pretty good. So we're going to just glue this up on this end real quick. And I'm all but certain Bob's going to insist we trial this out. So we've, we've got glue on all of those tabs. We're going to put this bow cap on here, and we might use our fancy weights here again just to hold that in place. And one more something. That big roll of tape maybe, or yeah, that's fine. Here again, everybody's got something sitting around their garage. You can put a bottle of water or a 
12 pack of pop or a paint can or yeah we use uh, we've used many things as weights if you've got any dumbbells or, or plate weights you know exercise stuff sometimes people we've used those and they work good too all right we're going to do the same thing down here and uh, get this lined up we're going to trace this out real quick I'm going to let you do this and start taping and caulking on there. Right? Okay. okay, Bob's going to cut that out. Now, on these boats, when, we, when you build one of these boats, you, end up with, you can end up with two different kinds of uh, seams on the boats. You all can see this brown edge on here. That's our, that's our flutes from our cardboard. Those are exposed flutes in there. Okay, anytime you've got those exposed flutes, we need to seal that up somehow. And when you've got a seam like that, you don't want to caulk that seam because it's hard to get enough caulk in there to properly seal that. So that's a seam that we would put some tape on. And like I said before, we talked about uh, a couple of different kinds of tapes that you can use. And I'll bring these over. The, you know, this good old paper tape, this is what I like to use. This is a paper tape also, but it's a, it's a self-adhesive paper tape. I'll just pull a little of that off of here. And that's how we would seal that seam. And I'm not going to do the full length of the seam. I'm just going to do part of it here just to, to show you what we want to do. We want to, we want to cover up all those flutes. Okay, just simply, that's all you have to do is tape it like that. And there again, you can use masking tape or you can use this tape. And I'll show you how to use this tape here in a little bit because I really like this. This really works well. Uh, but, but what you want to do here is you want to cover those flutes so no water can get in there. In these boats, there's no waterproofing inside this bow or inside that stern, so any water that gets in there, once it gets in there, boy, it soaks through the whole boat, and then your boat gets soggy and it breaks in half. But if you get all of the seams sealed up good and you get polyurethane on it that we talked about earlier and get it all coated with polyurethane and paint, these boats can last for years and years. We've got one boat uh, that we'll have out there this, uh, this spring that I believe will be its 17th year that we've raced the same boat because we've, we've coated it with polyurethane, we've sealed up all the seams good, um, caulked it good, take, take care of it. That's, and when I say take care of it, what that means is when you're, you're all done building your boat, and you start moving the boat around, you've got to be real careful not to bump it or ding it on anything. If you're carrying it and you hit a sharp corner or something, boy, it'll punch a hole through this cardboard real fast. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull this, uh, this blue tape off of here now. And um, can we turn it around? Or? We're going to try to turn it around here, and I'm going to show you how we use this, this other this other style of tape. This has got an adhesive on it that's activated or gets sticky when you add water to it. So we're just going to do like I did on the front there. Just put a short piece of it on there. But I just dunk it. I got some water here. I just dunk it, hold it up, shake off the excess water, and then I've got a, a little towel or a sponge and we're going to do the same thing because we've got to cover up these flutes. Just gently kind of lay it on there and smooth it out. And then you take your towel or sponge and wipe off the excess water. It's like that. So now we've, we've covered these flutes up. And this, when this tape dries, it really becomes, it becomes one with the cardboard. And here's why I like this kind of tape better than the self-adhesive tapes. We've had boats in the past where we've used this self-adhesive tape and you get out there on a nice warm sunny day and even though you've got paint and polyurethane and uh, over the top of this self-adhesive tape, that adhesive in the hot sun gets sticky and slippery and it'll actually start to slide and come loose even though it's under the paint. This paper tape that you wet like I did there, it doesn't move. I mean, it's, it stays in place. So anyway, that's how, you, that's how we deal with these exposed flute type seams. Now if you remember, this seam along the front, 
the cardboard knuckled in. So we don't have any exposed flutes here, but that's still a potential source for water to get inside of our boat. And that's a seam that we would caulk. And really, we just use this caulk that we talked about earlier, and we just put a, just a little seam of it down there. It doesn't take much. You just need to create a barrier to fill in any little pinholes that might be in there to uh, prevent any water from getting in there. I think your uh, stern cap is dry here, Bob. All right, we're going to take this clamp off. Oh, well, let me tell you one more thing about this tape. This tape. It comes in these giant rolls. That's enough <laughs> to build a bunch of boats, but you can ruin this in a hurry. And the way you ruin it is you're in your garage or wherever you're working, and you've got that sitting on the floor, and somebody spills some water, okay? And water gets on the edge of that. You've ruined the whole roll because that water seeps up in there, activates that adhesive, and I've got probably 50 rolls of, now I'm exaggerating, I've probably got 10 rolls of this around the house that have been ruined because that water gets up in there and it, it just activates it and it sticks it to itself and then you can't use it. So you gotta be real careful and not leave it laying around uh, to where anybody would spill any water on it. All right, we kinda got, starting to look like a boat? I hope so. Now, if we take this guy now and, and we try to turn it and twist it, it doesn't flex at all. I mean, it's, it's strong, and that's because of these double walls, the front and rear bulkhead, the center bulkhead, really adds a lot of strength and rigidity to it. Um, so now we've got this, if you can, just pretend with me that we've taped all of our We've taped all of our seams with the exposed flutes. We've caulked all of our seams that don't have exposed flutes. Now you're ready to put polyurethane on that. We're not gonna do that today, but you know, we said the oil-based polyurethane, a lot of times we put like two or three or maybe even four coats of polyurethane on there. And usually after the second coat, if you're gonna put a third coat, we'll lightly sand it before putting a third or fourth coat on there. And then once that's all dry and you want to come back and paint it, you can paint it with the oil base or the uh, water base like we talked about. But I'd li lightly sand that, uh, the last coat of polyurethane too before you put your paint on there. And that allows your paint to stick to the boat a little bit better. This, we talked a little bit about classes of boats earlier. And um, this is what's called a class one boat. There's um, and a class one boat is a boat that is going to be propelled with oars or, or oars. There's also what we have is called a class two boat or a mechanical boat. Now a mechanical or a class two boat, the whole boat has to be made of cardboard just like class one, but it can have a propulsion and or steering system made out of materials other than cardboard. Uh, there's an example of one right there. Man, that's a good looking guy on that boat. Um, but that, that's a propeller drive boat. It's got a pedal assembly there with a chain that goes down to a little gearbox and there's a drive shaft that goes out the back and there's actually a propeller back there. But really, the propeller doesn't propel the boat, it's the jet engines. <laughs> um, but there's all, and there's also a little lever there on the side. You, can't, you can see my uh, right hand, my right hand is down there. And that goes to a rudder. There's actually two rudders on the front of that boat that steer the boat. Um, but that boat, uh, the name of that boat is Astro, as you can see there. And the last two years, we've had uh, a water skier behind Astro, none other than George Jetson that you've seen up here. So um, that's just some, some other ideas. You know, that's a little more advanced. Uh, but, you know, if, I recommend anybody that's participating for the first time, build a class one boat. And if you like it and you want to come back and do it again the following year, maybe, maybe think about a, a class two or mechanical boats. There's lots of, we've built boats with paddle wheels. Uh, we've seen all kinds of different propeller systems that people have done out there. We've got uh, oh, some engineering students from UTA and or Tarleton State University. They'll come up and build a class two or a mechanical boat like that. Are we doing, uh, Christy, are we doing class three boats this year? Build on site? Okay, and we also have a third class, a class three, which is a build on site boat. If you don't have time or a place, 
We also do what's called a class three or a build on site boat where you show up the day of the race and we'll give you two or three sheets of cardboard, uh, a roll of duct tape. Now I told you you can't use duct tape on these boats, but the class three or build on site boats, you can use duct tape. But what we do is we give you a yardstick and a pencil and a, uh, a little um, a box cutter sheet of plastic and some duct tape and people build a boat on site two hours they get a two hour time limit to build a boat and then we actually put those boats in the water and that's a lot of fun we've had 15 15 plus or minus entries every year on that and uh, that that's a lot of fun if you don't have a, have the time or you, you you procrastinate and you just don't quite get your boat built in time and you uh, but you still want to come out and say man I'm, I'm gonna do a build on site boat and that's that's kind of fun too but uh, like I said, Bob and I and Gavin, I think everybody's going to stay after and answer any questions that anybody might have um, with regards to anything on the boats that we've done here today. I know that some of that kind of seemed repetitive, but I wanted you guys to see, you know, kind of what happens and how a boat goes together from start to finish. Hopefully we did okay with that. Um, I, I, can I open up for a few questions right now, Jay? Is that all right? Yeah. Does anybody have a quick question uh, that might pertain to everybody that, and I'll stay after for some more specifics. Yes, ma'am. Yes, we, we prefer everybody bring their own oars. Uh, there's usually a few out there that can be borrowed, but that kind of gets hectic and messy with 200 boats and trying to coordinate, you know, all those oars. Uh, the question is, would I put a bulkhead or a wall like this between each individual in the boat? And yes, I would. I, I like in all of my boats to create an individual compartment for each, each crew member because that adds a lot of strength to the boat. I teach fifth grade. This will be my 13th boat to build with fifth graders this year. So. Over the years, I've, I've learned a few things about building boats with kids, um, and I just would like to say that it's really kind of the best thing we do all year. And I'm not just talking about the fun part, but the academic part, because I'm sure you could tell when you were watching Mr. Daly up here, there's a lot of engineering that goes into this, and there's a lot of real world math. I mean, we can sit and teach, look at little boxes on pieces of paper, and say length times width times height, but when you're doing this, you really have to measure length times width times height, and you really have to apply it, and you have to figure out how much weight can I put in this boat? How much draft am I going to have in this boat? Um, what kind of boat should we build? Uh, how many people do we want in this boat? And it's a real team project. The kids have to work together to make those decisions. So it's real world learning, which is what why we're here that's why teachers are here is so that our kids can go off and do things in the real world um, so I wanted to talk about just getting started um, I just kind of went through why you should build a, a, a boat it covers about every single it would cover every single one of your measurement texts and and also your um, a lot of your geometry texts as well as a lot of your physics texts so you are covering texts when you're building this boat um, you, every kid gets to feel, have a part in this. Every student that you, you have do this with you. Um, I found that, you know, everybody always says, oh, this is a great project for your gifted kids. Well, no, actually, this is a great project for all of your kids because every kid has a strength and it, this plays to everybody's strength. They can, if they're artistic, it, it plays to that strength. If they're really good at hands-on things and measuring things and they're spatial, it applies to that strength. If they're very detail-oriented and they're, they, they're really good at measuring, it plays to that strength. So you, you find out things that you didn't know about your students when you're building this boat. You can find out they have talents that you didn't know that they had or that they didn't know that they had. So that's one of the best parts of the project. It's teamwork and it's just fun. You know, when we're building it, we're, we're doing it on Saturdays. They're bringing their iPods. We're, as long as it's appropriate music, we're listening to their iPods and, and, and it's just a really good time to get to know your students. Um, 
how do you get your, if you're a teacher or a scout troop, or how do you get your money, how do you get your supplies? You know, we have a science budget in your building, and that's one thing you could talk to your principal about is if there's any money in there. Um, activity fund for your building. Uh, I've, I've never had to use any of that, actually. What I've had most of the time, I've sent out a letter to my parents and just give them, given them a supply list of things that we need, and they send things up to school. You know, maybe somebody will send a gallon of glue up or a roll of tape up or some sponges up or some paint brushes up. I've also always take advantage of the free cardboard if you're a nonprofit organization. That comes in really handy. Um, our dad's club and our PTA have also funded part of our projects before. Um, corporate sponsors, um, Home Depot or Arlington Hardware. Actually, Arlington Hardware, they're a great sponsor. They've always been really helpful in helping me with my supplies. Um, they don't give them to me, but you know they always find exactly what I need, and they always direct me to the cheapest thing so that I don't overspend, so that's really nice. Um, the number one thing when you're building a boat with kids is where are you going to build it? Uh, and you know, for me, that's our science lab at school. But for I've had went years when I was at another elementary school where a parent offered their garage that like just lived a few houses away. That was really wonderful. Uh, but you do need a place that you can sweep, make sure the floor is really clean because you just lay this on top of one little pebble or rock and it's going to put a little hole right in your boat. So you have to be really careful about that. Um, depending on your schedule, I try to get ours folded up to, without the bulkheads and the, the caps and stuff, I try to get it folded up to a movable condition in one day. Like I, I'll, I'll be up there one Saturday just so that whatever room I choose I can pick it up and put it on a table so that they can still use that room. Um, always remember to look at the door of the room that you're building the boat in and make sure that your boat is going to go out that door when it's all together and it's a full length and make sure the hallway is wide enough if you have a really long boat and there's no way to navigate through that door then you know that's kind of a problem when you can't get the boat out of the science lab so and that has happened to people before so you know it's kind of interesting to see how you deal with those situations so make sure that wherever you're at, you know how you're going to get your boat in and out and to the event. That's the other thing. Make sure you have something big enough to get it to the event. Um, these are some of the youth boats from the past. And you know this boat right here, number 63, is very much like this boat right here, that design. And I think, especially for elementary school kids, this is a really great design. It's a really um, the, you know, there's a lot of them when you look through your packet and you look at all those different holes, this might not be the most uh, efficient hole, but it works really well. It's very stable and especially if you're, if you're like me, I know in junior high maybe they can cut some of the cardboard, but in elementary school we don't let them use the box knives. And so if you're trying to build something with a V in the bottom of it, you have to build a bunch of what are they called, Gary? The little pieces of cardboard to hold it up. Ribs, yeah. And that takes a lot of cutting. So if you're the only one doing the cutting, you're gonna be cutting a lot of cardboard to do that. So think about um, you know, the, how you can achieve that. Um, the best part of it, one of the best parts is just picking your theme. You know, you, you get to that boat regatta and everybody's got themes. Last year we had a giant train there. There's been big giant pink tennis shoes there, and I mean, there's just boats that, that rockets, and and just it's as big as your imagination can be, and that is so fun for the kids to figure out how they do that. And a lot of time, that that's achieved by what we call a shell or something that you put over the top. I don't know if we have any pictures of those, but um, just like George Jetson over here, you know, that's really not necessary to actually be on the boat. It's something that could come off the boat, but when the judges are coming around and looking at the boat, it could be on there or, you know, Snoopy. I think Snoopy actually was on the boat though, wasn't he? No, he was just on the boat. So you can put things on your boat, build things to put on the boat to decorate it for the judges. And 
Uh, there is an event going on near the three-point basketball and the horseshoe competition called the mini boat regatta. And we have these little kind of boats that are in, available in kits. And these kits are for sale here today for six bucks, or you can get them at the River Legacy um, uh, Science Center. Uh, and you can assemble these boats and compete. Uh, so the, the boats are put into a gutter, or a, uh, I guess gutter is the best term, a gutter, and you blow them down and you race that way in that competition. And there's, uh, there's one example that I just broke, and uh, there are others, <laughs> others out front. But anyway, so that's the mini boat regatta. Did we do enough on that? Yeah. All right, the sponsors of the uh, regatta are whom? Let's go in the blue right there. Pardon? Star Telegram is one of them. Okay, give me another one. Randall Mill Pharmacy. Here's one here, Tim. And who said Westlake back there? The man on the aisle back there? And Viridian. All right. And she gets the fourth one over there. All right, there's a couple of other, uh, there's a couple of other groups that are very important to us on that event day, and one is the place where we are, and this is not good English, do we have any English teachers in the room? Uh, the place where the event is at, being held at, you're still not supposed to end it in a preposition, is located. Hurricane Harbor is very generous to us, they're very kind to us, they, they help us with the facility, with the sound system, with the lifeguards, the uh, Arlington Park and Rep people are in the pool all day long uh, uh, helping and moving stuff around and so the Arlington Park and Rec people and the city of Arlington who give us this facility to dribble uh, glue on the floor with, uh, 